Welcome to the ECS Podcast. I'm Rocky Calvo, Executive Director of the Electrochemical Society. The purpose of this podcast is to connect the dots between the sciences, our everyday lives, and the sustainability of the planet. So we are here at the 227th ECS meeting in Chicago at the Nanocarbons Division Luncheon, and we have five guests today. This is a historic gathering of past chairmen of the ECS Nanocarbons Division, which is, by our understanding, the most significant uh, division that holds a symposium in this field in the world. Uh, certainly for ECS, it's been our most significant symposium in terms of number of papers and participation. This thing was started up <laughs> in 1992. So I'd like to uh, start by uh, going around the table and, and introducing you, and, 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 and you can tell uh, our, our audience a little bit about yourself. So to my left is Carl Kadish. He is the founding chairman, uh, the founding the founder, we like to call him the godfather, <laughs> of, of this uh, introduction of this scientific discipline. He introduced it to us, uh, was the first organizer, uh, got it off the ground and, and put it in motion. So, uh, Carl, uh, welcome, uh, and tell us about yourself. Hello, uh, Carl Kadish. I'm a professor of chemistry, University of Houston. Uh, I was here at the start, 1991, the very first meeting in Phoenix, 180th meeting of the Electrochemical Society. Uh, fullerenes had been around a little bit, but not too much. There were several micrograms of quantity. A lot of people were interested. And one of the future presidents of the society, Barry Miller, said, let's do something new. We have this area, fullerene, C60. Uh, why don't we have a symposium? And so there was a symposium that Barry, another colleague, started. I was one of the first attendees. Uh, the meeting took place in Phoenix. It was highly successful. And from there, they said, do it again, and do it again, and do it again. And from the 180th meeting all the way through today, we've been doing it, doing it ever since. So I was there as head of the group from formation in 1993 through 1998. Uh, we published books Every year, our first book at the time uh, came out actually in 1995, but there were uh, 1,500 pages, 180 authors, a lot of participants. That's basically the... So we got off to a start. Now, in fairness, um, Prashant Kaman is next, but I, I should mention Rodney Ruoff, who's absent from this table, yes. uh, who was the second chair, and uh, sort of your... Uh, you mentored him into the role, and he took it from you, and then uh, passed it on to Prashant. So, welcome, Prashant yeah. Kamat. Uh, <coughs> I'm Prashant Kamat, uh, a professor of chemistry and biochemistry at University of Notre Dame, and a very active member of uh, ECS. Uh, and I think uh, I've been uh, attending almost uh, every spring meeting uh, uh, for the last 20 years. And I have seen uh, how the Fullerenes uh, group as we used to call, and uh, they used to have a packed audience uh, in the symposia, and uh, 200, everybody was curious, what this new buckyball is about? And this is before the discovery of carbon nanotubes, and then came the carbon nanotubes, and then also came graphene, and then there was sort of a, a need to bracket all these areas, and uh, again, with Rocky and other uh, discussion with the other presidents, past presidents, again Barry Miller. So we came to the conclusion that uh, we are mature enough as a group and to become a division. And it needed a lot of support within the ECS and outside. And finally, we chartered the um, division bylaws and everything. And uh, it was uh, first time, I think it was in 2003, that we became part of a division, so which gave us the full rights to be part of the ECS. And uh, again, thank you, Rocky, for uh, your uh, uh, interest and involvement in supporting that. And uh, as part of it, we have done a lot of uh, special issues in interface. Uh, uh, and also the fullerenes, I think we did about um, more than 20 different volumes. And uh, then finally, uh, it, the field got matured and uh, we moved on. And after me, uh, Dirk took over and uh, you can... Uh so, thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
Let's next go to Francis D'Souza. Yeah, Welcome. It. Oh, thank you, Rocky. My name is Francis D'Souza. I'm a professor of chemistry and material science and engineering from University of North Texas. So I became the chair of uh, Fullerene Division in 2004. At that time, it was a well-established division. Then uh, we kind of realized that uh, having a division, that means we need to have some awards established. So that's where I took the role of uh, uh, working with some um, uh, companies, especially applied nanofluorescence uh, and also SES Research. And the SES Research agreed to kind of support the Young Investigator Award and applied nanofluorescence, uh, whose owner here, Dr. Weissman, so he kind of kindly agreed to support Smalley Award. So after uh, having done those things, uh, now we award them every other year to the most deserving candidate. All said and done, uh, I think uh, we owe a big thank you to ECS for having provided us a good platform to bring people from all over the world and discuss. And every time, you know, if you have any small or bigger issues, uh, they have worked with us, especially Rocky. Uh, you've been amazing for the last 20 some years. And, uh, you know, so we, we appreciate your help and eff effort. Well, thank you. I, I think I'm getting too much credit here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Stop. Stop <that>. So <laughs> next we have Dirk Goldie, and I want to say he is the winner of the Richard Smalley Research Award, uh, which is a great award. And we have you to thanks for bringing that award and Richard Smalley, before he had passed away, had been a contributor to this symposium and this organization. Dirk? Yeah, hi, Rocky. It's a great pleasure to introduce myself. My name is Dirk Uldi. I'm chair for physical chemistry at the University of Erlangen Nuremberg in Germany. And I'd like to just uh, wrap up a few things. I mean, you said earlier this is probably one of the leading divisions or symposia within the ECS. Uh, I would just go much beyond and saying this is probably the only place to meet, let's say, like worldwide. Uh, it started off, as I said, let's say, with fullerenes. This is the prime time for people working in chemistry, in physics, in theory, in engineering. Uh, and I think the same can be, I mean, honestly said for carbon nanotubes and graphene. Uh, I took over from Francis de Souza in 2008, and we pretty much consolidated the diversity of the different symposia that we were running, very successfully picking up, let's say, with the, the guidance of Carl Kadish, uh, to add a huge uh, symposium on porphyrin and also with Pashant Kamad as the two preceding chairs on other materials, hybrid materials for uh, energy conversion in general. So having said that, this is the place where people meet. Our, we, as earlier said, I mean, we're like 350 papers or abstracts at this meeting here, which is kind of a consequence that we really stand for quality. People love to come they love to present their science to discuss. This is equally said for the senior people, but as well, let's say, like for the students. It's great to hear you say that. We're, we're very proud of that, and, and you all are the creators of that, and so you should feel proud as well, and I know you do. Uh, our last guest is the current fearless leader of the group, is, is Bruce Wiseman, and I want to say has carried the flag in the tradition of the leaders before him and has done a, a great job for Fullerenes. Bruce, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bruce Wiseman. I'm a professor of chemistry at Rice University. And I guess Rice University has a kind of a special role in nanocarbons research because it was the uh, home of uh, my colleague Rick, Rick Smalley, after whom the Richard Smalley Award is named, of course. So he was a pioneer uh, who discovered the first nanocarbon, C60, and made huge contributions to the advancement of study of carbon nanotubes. And uh, his untimely death in 2005 was really a great loss to the field. But uh, at that time, it seemed to me that the Electrochemical Society division that we're in would be a perfect place to, uh, to honor his memory with, the, with this award. So I, I sort of took the initiative to try to find uh, some donors for this award. And I actually started out with a, uh, a wealthy... Uh, businessman in Houston who was uh, who knew Rick and admired him and was willing to get the ball uh, rolling by writing a large check to to start this uh, this award that our division gives and since then I've been fortunate enough to be able to uh, add to the endowment through 
uh, some revenue contributed from my small company, Applied Nanofluorescence. So now we're able every two years to really recognize world leaders in this field, and I think it's really appropriate for us to do that uh, since we are the home of nanocarbons research. I have been chair since uh, 2012, I guess, and one thing that has struck me as being very vital about this division is its flexibility. Uh, as time goes on, certain, sub, certain areas of nanocarbon science wane and other ones wax, and uh, this has to be reflected in, in our symposia. So our symposia are always sort of uh, in a state of uh, constant re-examination, and some of them uh, are basically discontinued or merged with others when they are not viable anymore. And when new topics come along, then we try to uh, provide a forum for those as well. So, for example, our, uh, na our carbon nanotube symposia have grown over a relatively small number of years from being non-existent to being really one of the world's leading forums for researchers in this field. And uh, it always amazes me when so many outstanding researchers come and uh, pay their own way for all the expenses associated with the conference to just come here and get together. So we're not attracting them through the model of, of identifying some, some eminent uh, star in the field and paying them a lot of money to come and hoping other folks will come to listen to them. This is a very flat and sort of democratic symposium structure that we have here, which really appeals to me. So we allow everyone to have 20 minutes to describe their research. And, uh, you know, some folks think 20 minutes isn't enough time. I, I mm -hmm. am a big shot. I deserve more time. <laughs> well, but it turns out that if you organize your thoughts, it works yeah. out very well. And yeah. that gives more people a chance to, to speak. And uh, I think a lot of it leads to a workshop-like atmosphere where there's a lot of informal discussion. And I think that's one reason why people keep coming back. So that's one of the things that I like best about the Electrochemical Society Symposium. Well, and it's particularly good in, in your division. You, you all have really created a great model for getting the new ideas, attracting the new people, the new areas. That's very difficult to do organizationally. And, and you, you really, again, it's a, it's a great model for some of our other divisions to follow. Um, I'd also like to say thanks again. Uh, you're right. Uh, uh, you mentioned you're being uh, primarily responsible for getting this uh, Smalley Award. And the, the prestige of having an award named after a scientist like that, you know, is gonna, one of the great inventors. Uh, of our time uh, to be associated with this organization and given out and provided by this organization. It's, it's just a tremendous thing to have to be affiliated with. And remarkably, I'm not aware of another award uh, in Smalley's honor uh, from any other scientific organization. So uh, we're, still, we're still alone there. Unique. Yeah, yeah that's so good. it makes it even better. I'd like, to, I'd like to get to the science a little bit with the idea that um, you're connecting the dots. So in other words, it's not just the deep science, but, you know, how that influences medicine, energy. So, uh, and I'll come back to you first, Bruce, uh, because I think it might be interesting, you know, to, to comment about Smalley himself uh, and how the discovery of the Buckmeister fullerene influenced or changed some scientific direction. Uh, well, it, was, it made a huge impact in chemistry. Uh, I teach a little course in nanocarbons now, and uh, as part of that, I look up, I do a little literature search to see how many papers are in the literature, and the fullerenes, I think, have on the order of 50,000 papers in the literature. So that is an enormous uh, consequence, you know, for a single discovery. Sure, sure. And Carl, your work? Well, I started out as an electrochemist. I've been coming to the Electrochemistry Society since the early 1970s. And so I approached it uh, certainly within, in, in the first meetings we had, there were very limited quantities of this very valuable material. And there were a lot of theoretical papers. Uh, one would expect to add six electrons, but nobody had ever seen more than two. What are the orbitals? Where are the electrons going? And so from my point of view, I'm an experimentalist. And so uh, I brought people who did experiments, who started to evaluate. You put one electron into a buckyball. Where does it go? What does it look like? What's the ESR? How many electrons can you really add? What's a homolumo gap? Can you oxidize it? These types of questions. And at the same time, we had theoreticians. So my job was to do the experiments, the simple experiments, and have the theoreticians uh, come in and do that. Um, it, it's interesting, the original papers, when we started to publish that, a lot of them were technical. Uh, how do you make buckyballs? Uh, what does it cost? The second paper, the first paper in there is buckyballs, how low will the price go? 
And at the time, it was thousands of dollars for a very small amount, and now, obviously, it's come, come down low. Uh, so I'd been doing electrochemistry for a long time, and that was my area that I started. Um, coming in here, of course, at the beginning was convincing people this is an electrochemical society meeting, and you don't really have to be a pure electrochemist. Do something that the electrochemists are interested in, and they'll come to you. And I think that's 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 happened. We've brought them there. So. There's a good connection there um, that we didn't talk about much at the time. Is the the interdisciplinary nature of electrochemistry, which I guess helps make this a home, uh, a nice home for the carbon nanotechnology. Prashant? Yeah, I just want to extend uh, uh, what Carl was saying. Uh, is when we started first fullerenes. Uh, the corridor discussions always often led to what is fullerene? Why we you guys are here in the ECS meeting? What is to do with electrochemistry? You know, and they start thinking. And you just turn around 10, 20 years later, the nanocarbons are part of electrochemistry, whether it is organic solar cell, which the PCBM is still the major part, which is a fullerene derivative, or you go to fuel cells or uh, batteries, uh, nanocarbons, uh, graphene, nanotubes. Everyone is integral part of it. And it's very hard to see now how an early vision to host uh, these kind of a things as a win-win situation for everyone right. and to the society. So, uh, again, uh, I always say that whenever a new field emerges, uh, never underestimate what it can do. Uh, f 10 or 20 years from now. Yes, thank you for that. I think uh, Carl and you mentioned Barry Miller earlier, a couple of people who had that vision, and yeah. they sort of put their arm around me and said, you know, you got to help us do this, <laughs> and, uh, and look where we ended up. Dirk? Yeah, I think, I mean, what, what Carl said is, let's say, like, in a way, pioneering with a far view on, let's say, how electrochemistry and features, I mean, basic features you can discover and establish by electrochemistry and how that shapes other fields. Prashant said that. So I think, I mean, most of what we're seeing these days are based on this pioneering work that were established in the, in the early to mid-90s. Mm -hmm. Francis? Well, <coughs> as uh, I know Carl and uh, Prashant and Dirk mentioned, so initially we did have some identity crisis. Uh, basically, we came from kind of non-electrochemist background. Or some of us are electrochemists, but most of them are, were not. As a result, uh, when we wanted to be part of the society, so we had to do more than what uh, other division people would do. So that took us a while because, uh, you know, folks from other division, they were still thinking, you know, these are not part of the electrochemistry community. So that took us a while uh, and they did see the business model that we have and the revenue we generate for the society. So finally at the end I think uh, the money talks and uh, now everybody kind of have accepted us as part of the electrochemistry community. Uh, that is a good news. Yes. And uh, even though we are so diverse because it is not only electrochemistry Every form of science is being discussed here. Uh, that is a plus thing. And uh, I think uh, from our model, the rest of the electrochemistry community uh, also would uh, learn something in the coming years. That's mm -hmm. what uh, we are kind of hoping. Yeah. Well, as I said, uh, you've been a great model. And I think we have, uh, to some extent, you know, uh, tried to adapt in other places what, what you've done. What you've done here, I, I, the, the new ideas, the new blood, the mm -hmm. morphing in the direction of, of, of the new sciences. I still want to get to the science, so, and I told you I was going to ask you this. Oh, okay. Significant area that your discipline is contributing to. Uh, well, right now, our discipline is focused uh, mainly in uh, energy harvesting, and uh, some folks are working on sensing and uh, biosensing, and some uh, folks are working on biomedical applications of nanocarbons. So there is not a field that uh, folks have not touched. Mm -hmm. So that means, uh, you know, it is a group of uh, very eminent scientists exploring the possibility in every single field. And in some cases, we do have some breakthroughs. 
mm-hmm. and uh, in some cases you know efforts are being made and sooner or later so you know you can expect great uh, big discoveries and uh, great uh, breakthroughs uh, from our community that is uh, for mm-hmm. sure Bruce, can you add something that the people uh, can understand who aren't scientific, that an application that's affecting, uh, making the world a better place? Well, um, I think that the killer applications for nanocarbons are still a little bit in the future instead of a current industrial product. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're all, of course, trying to hasten the day that that'll be true. But there are many possibilities on the horizon. Uh, and there's just one from my laboratory. We're trying to use the optical properties of carbon nanotubes to make a new type of industrial strain sensor. And I, I never knew anything about strain sensing, but I linked up with a structural engineer who let me know that the technology for, for this very important industrial application was really antiquated and very, uh, very uh, inadequate. And we realize that there are special properties of these nanocarbons that can lend themselves to an, a, a, an alternative technology that might really catch on. And there's a lot of industrial interest in this. So I think if we can perfect applications like that uh, and uh, disseminate them into the real world, then it will really invigorate this field even more. Uh, the medical world is another place. We have a, uh, a, in, an increasingly important symposium in biomedical applications of nanocarbons where they can be agents for uh, (coughs) diagnosis uh, and therapeutic applications as well. That, of course, could potentially be very, very large. Great. Dirk, our award winner? Yeah, yeah, and electronics and nanoelectronics and optoelectronics shouldn't be forgotten as potential Mm -hmm. applications. So it's not just a, let's say, freestanding on its own aspect, but rather we're in integrated circuits that would Mm -hmm. certainly shape the market. Great. Prashant, anything left to add? Uh, no, again, as I said, uh, carbon to carbon is part of uh, batteries uh, and storage batteries in particular. So nano carbon having a uh, platform can increase the surface area and the capacity. And there have been a lot of uh, people are pushing to get this type of materials because everyone loves uh, to have their cell phone uh, last for uh, eight days instead of a day. There you right? go. <laughs> so how do you increase the capacity in yep. these kind of a systems is to have a platform like graphene where you can disperse the catalyst and load up more uh, charges. Again, it has plus and minus uh, in these things, but again, it opens up new areas uh, for these ones. And uh, another one is uh, transparent uh, conducting surfaces. Uh, the There are plastic films on which... Uh, People deposit graphene sheets as a cheap uh, source because you don't need any metals. So you can get the conducting sheets uh, made up of graphene. So that's another, again, goes back to Dirk's is uh, having more electro op- optics, uh, sorry, optoelectronics. I, some of the things you said actually led me to more questions that, that I even have here, but I want to respect your symposium uh, and that you have a start time as well. And I also want to give the founder the last word, and you can tell us whatever you want <laughs> to finish this uh, nice podcast. Well, I want to say it's amazing. My, my colleagues uh, have certainly pointed out where the field is, uh, where the field may be going. And, and looking, we, we had books every year, very large books, you know, 1,500, 1,800 pages, 150 authors in some cases. And looking at what's there, what's said, and where we are now, it's just so much of a quantum jump in what's there. And if we listen to this podcast in one year or two years or three years, and I think, you know, what's going to be there would be interesting to look and see what we have in the future because we're on a fast, fast increase right now. Great. Uh, If you can permit me, I want to add one more thing is to thank all our participants in this symposia over the years. And they have made it. This is a successful division. So we owe them a lot uh, for continued support. That's a good way to to, to finish it off. And I want to say thanks. And I also want to say, I guess I get the last word, Carl. (laughs) I'm the host. (laughs) Um, It's it's been... uh, a real 
uh, great experience. I was going to say privilege, but that's not exactly it because I've, I've appreciated the opportunity to work with all of you. I, if, uh, it just makes me feel good uh, that you know I, that we, we've been able to contribute to what you've accomplished, and, and I've I've enjoyed uh, I've enjoyed the relationship and, and knowing and working with everybody. And so I just want to say thanks to you for that. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Keep up the good work.